Hello, and welcome to Settle the Stars. Episode 16, The Moons of Uranus and Neptune. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. Last week, we visited Uranus and Neptune, learning about the mysterious icy giants lurking at the edge of our solar system and providing a wealth of new information and questions for astronomers, despite their incredible distance from us here on Earth. Today, we'll be getting a closer look at some of the most often overlooked features of these enigmatic planets, their moons and rings. While the planets themselves posed quite a challenge to spot in the sky, their moons can be even trickier, especially around the larger planets where there can be so many orbiting objects that it can be difficult to tell what's what. This confusion is well known to William Herschel, discoverer of Uranus and two of its moons. The two moons he discovered, Titania and Oberon, were found six years after he discovered the planet, along with what he believed were four other moons and a possible ring. Unfortunately, no other astronomers were able to confirm the existence of the four additional moons for a full 50 years. In 1851, English astronomer William Lassell's improved reflecting telescopes were able to resolve two additional moons, Ariel and Umbriel. Owing to some confusion in the scientific community over the usual Roman numbering systems for satellites, the following year William Herschel's son John Herschel decided on the names we use today. Shedding the tradition of using names from Greek mythology, the younger Herschel assigned names from magical spirits of English literature. Oberon and Titania are fairies from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Sylph Ariel and Gnome Umbriel are drawn from Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock. For almost 100 years, these would remain the only known moons of Uranus, until 1948. At McDonald Observatory in Texas, Gerard Kuiper would discover the fifth and smallest of the five largest moons, which he would call Miranda, from Shakespeare's The Tempest. The rest would have to wait until Voyager 2 could get a closer look in 1986. As a result of the flyby, ten additional moons were added to the list, with one more, Perdicia, identified from old Voyager photographs in 1999. With the improvement of ground-based telescopes in the 90s adjusting for atmospheric distortions, nine distant irregular moons were identified, followed by the last three in 2003, Cupid, Mab, and Margaret. That brings us to a grand total of 27 known moons, which scientists have grouped into four large divisions. The smaller inner moons, the five large or major moons, and the outer retrograde and prograde irregular moons. We'll look at each group in turn before discussing the rings, beginning with the largest group of 13 inner moons. The inner moons of Uranus all orbit closer to the planet than the larger moon Miranda, and are interspersed throughout the major rings of Uranus. Their similar composition and proximity to each other lead scientists to believe that they could have formed from the fragmentation of one or more small inner moons. Moving from Uranus outward, the closest, Cordelia and Ophelia, are shepherds of the planet's Epsilon ring. But there may be two as yet undiscovered moons even closer, shepherding the Alpha and Beta rings. Moving outward, there's a close grouping of moons Bianca, Cressida, Desdemona, and Juliet, all averaging less than 100 kilometers across, with Portia and Rosalind marking the outer boundaries of the Upsilon ring. On the other side of the ring is another close grouping of Cupid, Perdicia, and Belinda, with Puck following after. Puck is the largest of the inner moons at 164 kilometers across, a lumpy ball of ice and black irradiated carbon, and the only of the inner moons lucky enough to have been imaged by Voyager 2. Though only 25 kilometers across, the last of the group, Mab, shares the same composition characteristics. Mab resides within the wide Mu ring, continuously shedding the ice that forms the ring. The inner moons are an unruly bunch. Their gravitational fields constantly nudge each other, and their orbits are unstable and cross each other often. Astronomers predict that it's only a matter of time before there's a collision among the group. Desdemona, in particular, may impact either Cressida or Juliet sometime within the next hundred million years. I didn't say it would happen soon. That brings us to the next group, the real moneymakers, the major moons. For perspective, the tiniest of these, Miranda, is about 471 kilometers across, and several times more massive than the rest of the smaller moons combined. 
Even so, it's likely one of the smallest objects studied in the solar system so far that could be classified as being in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that it is massive enough to collapse into a sphere instead of a potato shape. Along with the rest of the major moons, Miranda orbits close to the equatorial plane of Uranus, which as you remember is skewed so that it appears to be lying down. Because it rotates perpendicular to its orbit, it shares the same extreme seasonal differences in light as Uranus. Miranda probably formed in the early days of the planet from an accretion disk, and along with the other large moons is differentiated. That means a separate inner core, mantle, and crust have formed. In this case, a rocky inner core with an icy mantle and crust. Miranda boasts some of the most extreme topography in the solar system despite its small size. The highest cliff in the known universe is here, the 20 kilometer high Verona Rupees. You could probably jump quite high with a surface gravity less than 1% that of Earth's, but probably not 20 kilometers. One theory to explain the extreme topography for such a small moon is that it was once locked into orbital resonance with one of the larger moons, either aerial or umbrial. This would have caused extreme tidal friction as the moon was pulled between the larger moon and Uranus, melting the interior into liquid water, which later froze. Anyone who has tried freezing water in a glass container knows what happens next. The ice expands, fracturing the container and, in the case of a small moon, creating massive canyons and cliffs. There's also evidence of a large resurfacing event. Noting the lack of large craters across major portions of the moon and the softened edges around some of the craters, some scientists believe cryovolcanism could have resurfaced much of the moon. Interestingly, the volcanic material responsible for the newer surface would have been too thick and viscous to be liquid water, but too fluid to have been chunks of solid water. Instead, scientists believe that a thick lava-like mixture of water with ammonia or ethanol could have been present. Some unique features not yet found anywhere else are huge oval or racetrack-shaped structures called coronae, spotted by Voyager 2. They're huge, over 120 miles wide and up to 12 miles deep, and caused some intense head-scratching back home as scientists struggled to identify the cause. The current front-runner theory is that the coronae formed due to a catastrophic disruption in the interior of the moon as upwellings of warm ice collapsed. Such a radical redistribution for such a small moon would have caused the entire moon to reorient itself within its orbit. While certainly a possible tourist destination for interplanetary athletes wondering how high they can jump, Miranda isn't likely to be visited much in the future by humans. It just doesn't have enough going for it but some of the other moons might have some interesting attractions. Miranda's big sister, Ariel, is next on our tour, and the resemblance is striking. Though much larger at over a thousand kilometers across, Miranda is also crisscrossed by huge canyons and cliffs, suggesting a similar model of interior composition, a rocky core with an icy mantle, though scientists still disagree whether the mantle could still be liquid in some places. Ariel's claim to fame among the Uranian satellites is the highest evidence for carbon dioxide among the group. There are a handful of natural processes that can produce carbon dioxide, so it's a little peculiar, but scientists believe it could be escaping the moon's interior through porous crust openings, which could suggest past geological activity. Further evidence of cryovolcanism like that on Miranda has been spotted in what look like old shield volcanoes, likely formed with a similar water ammonia slurry as hypothesized on the smaller moon. Ariel is relatively bright and reflective, likely due to the high amount of ice indicated on the surface by Voyager 2's instruments. Much darker, however, is the next moon, Umbriel. Umbriel is the darkest of all Uranian moons, reflecting less than half the light of Ariel, despite being about the same size, and with a slight bluish tinge of color. Otherwise, Umbriel appears to have a quieter past than the other moons, geologically speaking anyway. Craters are the only features identified on the moon so far, with many much larger than the other moons, suggesting a lack of resurfacing. One notable crater, named Wanda after an aboriginal Australian dark spirit, contains a wide band of bright material about 10 kilometers wide within the 131 kilometer wide crater. Scientists are unsure what could cause the bright feature, but suspect it's a deposit of carbon dioxide ice or some other material from the impact. 
Umbriel likely formed with the other moons from an accretion disk around the planet soon after formation, but could possibly have been created as a result of the hypothesized massive impact that knocked Uranus on its back. Initial heat from the formation of the moon could have led to differentiation into discrete internal layers, but any liquid interior is believed to have frozen long ago. Easily spotted from Umbriel is the next moon, Titania, largest of the Uranian moons, at about half the diameter of our own, approximately 1,578 kilometers across. It has a similar appearance to our own moon as well, with just a slight tinge of red or pink. And like our moon, it is tidally locked, revealing only one face to Uranus as it orbits, a trip which takes about 8.7 days to complete. The surface of Titania shows many of the same cliffs and canyons as the other moons, along with craters, though few enough to indicate a relatively recent resurfacing. This resurfacing probably occurred early after the moon's formation, followed by smaller episodes later which formed some of the smooth plains that are still visible today. Among the plethora of data collected by Voyager 2 was evidence of carbon dioxide on the surface, raising the possibility of a tenuous atmosphere. In 2001, scientists got a rare chance to confirm this when Titania occulted or aligned with a bright star in the background, which allowed astronomers to confirm the size of the moon and potentially detect an atmosphere. No atmosphere was detected, but it is possible one exists at a much thinner state than Triton or even Pluto. It could be that carbon dioxide accumulates in some low-lying areas, migrating between the poles as the seasons change and the sun's light disperses it. It's thought that the reddish tinge of the moon is caused by the bombardment of charged particles and micrometeorites, which affect the next moon on our voyage to an even greater degree. Oberon is the last of the major moons of Uranus, and only slightly smaller than Titania. It has a much darker red than Titania, not quite Mars red, but almost like a sepia photograph of our own moon. Oberon displays the craters and canyons common in this neighborhood of moons, and many of the same characteristics that suggest a similar model of formation and geology. It also exhibits differences in the leading and trailing edge common among the large moons. This discrepancy is caused by the unique rotation of Uranus. Most moons orbit their planets in the equatorial plane upright, meaning their surfaces spin as they orbit their planet and move through space. The Uranian moons spin and orbit, but since the entire system is tipped on its side, one pole is facing forward, or leading, while the other is facing backward, or lagging. This exposes one hemisphere to different forces and environments, leading to differences in color, density of impacts, and other interesting characteristics. In Oberon's case, the leading hemisphere is much redder than the lagging, likely because it's exposed to more bombardment and charged particles. The major moons teach us a lot about the formation of the planet and their unique features resulting from the extreme axial tilt of the system have shed a lot of light on the changes and impacts, literally, encountered as they move through the solar system. The remaining irregular moons that lie farther out into the orbit of Uranus are all retrograde, ranging in size from about 18 kilometers across, Trinculo, to about 157 kilometers across, Sycorax. Margaret is the only exception, a prograde irregular satellite about 20 kilometers across and the sole member of its group. The orbits of the inner moons of Uranus are punctuated by very thin rings, unlike either the thick bright rings of Saturn or the thin dusty rings of Jupiter. They appear to be composed of an extremely dark material, which could explain the difficulty in detecting them. There have been 13 distinct bands identified so far, grouped into three classifications, nine main rings, two dusty rings, and two outer rings. The darkness of the rings has not yet been explained, but could be a mixture of ice and organic materials darkened by radiation from the planet's magnetosphere. It's also possible that the rings are of a similar composition, though processed and pulverized, as the inner moons, further evidence of a shared origin, possibly as the result of the hypothesized massive impact. The discovery of rings around Uranus invited speculation that similar rings could be found around Neptune as well. Despite extensive ground-based observation prior to the visit of Voyager 2, results were inconclusive. In fact, during an occultation of a bright star by Neptune, scientists were excited to see the star dim around the planet, but not in the way they would expect with a ring system. The dimming would later be revealed to have been caused by one of the undiscovered moons of Neptune, 
an extraordinarily rare astronomical event. It would take a closer view by Voyager 2 in 1989 to definitively confirm the presence of a ring system, later confirmed by observations of the Hubble Space Telescope. In total, five distinct rings have been identified around Neptune, named Gal, Leverrier, Lassell, Arago, and Adams. If these names sound familiar, you're likely remembering them as astronomers who all contributed to the discovery of Neptune in our last episode. It's possible that a thin sheet of material exists between some of these rings, and the rings vary from the very narrow 100 kilometer wide to the largest lassell at over 5,000 kilometers across. Four Neptunian moons orbit among the rings, which are composed mostly of micrometer-sized dust like that found in the rings of Jupiter. Like Uranus, the dust material is likely a mixture of small amounts of ice with irradiated organics, making them dark and difficult to see. Overall, the rings are expected to be relatively young, much younger than the solar system. This points to a formation as the result of fragmentation from a former moon sometime in the past. So far, 14 moons of Neptune have been discovered in all. 13 tiny moonlets varying from the smallest, Hippocamp, at about 35 kilometers across, to the largest, Triton, dwarfing the rest at over 2,700 kilometers across. The mass distribution of the moons of Neptune is particularly striking, as the most lopsided of any other planet in the solar system. All the other moons combined only measure up to one-third of one percent of that of Triton. The smaller moons of Neptune are divided into the closer, regular moons that orbit in circular paths closer to the equatorial plane of the planets. The irregular moons follow elliptical or inclined orbits that are divided further into prograde and retrograde orbital directions. There are seven small regular moons, three prograde irregulars, and four retrograde irregulars. Interestingly, Triton is among this final group, the first clue to its unusual origin. As the only large moon in the solar system discovered to have a retrograde orbit, astronomers knew there was something strange about Triton. Moons in retrograde orbit cannot form in the same region of the solar nebula from which their planet forms. Larger than Pluto, and the only of Neptune's moons to be massive enough to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning its gravity has pulled it into that sphere shape, Triton is actually believed to have been a dwarf planet captured by Neptune's orbit. The Kuiper Belt is a likely place of origin for the hypothetical dwarf planet, as it contains other icy dwarf planets with similar characteristics. The capture theory also explains the relatively small number of moons surrounding Neptune, as compared to some of the other large planets in the solar system. Capture of a moon as large as Triton would have been highly disruptive to any existing moons, probably causing collisions and migrations or even ejections out of the system. In order for a large moon to be captured in a planet's gravity, it must slow down significantly in order to not just shoot past and escape. One way this can happen is by a collision with other objects, but more likely for larger objects is a scenario in which a binary system of two co-orbiting objects enters the planet's orbit. The objects interact in such a way that one of the objects is expelled from the system and the other loses enough energy to be taken up in the planet's orbit. Similar models are used to explain the capture of the moons of Mars and seem the most likely so far for Triton. Voyager 2 could only manage to image about 40% of the surface of Triton during its flyby in 1989, but what it found was fascinating. The surface appears as a light brownish color, with few visible craters and large flat plains suggesting active geological activity. The surface is composed of frozen nitrogen, with an intricate terrain and even a tenuous atmosphere. The atmosphere is extremely thin, only one seven hundred thousandth the pressure of our atmosphere here on Earth. There are traces of carbon monoxide and methane near the surface, and probably formed as a result of melting nitrogen from the crust. The crystalline structure of the nitrogen in the surface suggests an ambient temperature around negative 237 degrees Celsius, just about what you'd expect this far out from the sun. Surprisingly, the thin atmosphere has been shown to support clouds, which were observed in photographs from Voyager 2, and even a little bit of wind capable of transporting dust-sized materials a considerable distance. In geological terms, Triton is baby-faced, with most of the surface probably between 6 to 50 million years old. It is extremely flat, with no observed features rising beyond a kilometer. 
In addition to nitrogen, there's plenty of water ice and frozen carbon dioxide, along with deposits of organic materials called tholins, thought to be precursors of organic life. Most striking on Triton are the active geological features. Geysers have been spotted by Voyager 2, ejecting nitrogen gas and dust from beneath a surface as high as 8 kilometers high. Given the icy composition of the moon, it's assumed that geological processes like this are driven by lava-like mixtures of ice and ammonia instead of liquid rock. The clustering of these geysers within the sun-warmed regions suggests the sunlight plays a critical role in their activity despite its relative weakness this far out in the solar system. Those geyser eruptions can last as long as a year, with the weak atmospheric winds pulling material into great dark streaks observed in Voyager 2's images. More recent images from Earth have shown Triton becoming less red in color, suggesting that the continuous eruptions have bathed some of the darker surface in a new layer of nitrogen frost. Sprawled almost 2,000 kilometers wide lies the Leviathan Patera, a volcanic caldera-like structure making it the second largest volcanic dome discovered yet in the solar system, after Albamon's. Adjacent are two giant cryolava lakes, which are solid now, but would have qualified as stable surface liquid water while they were molten. It's been speculated the geological activity that caused these features could hint at an active molten interior with a large body of liquid water within the mantle. If this is true, the presence of organic compounds could indicate a possibility to support organic life. It may seem improbable for such a cold and distant world, but further study will be required to test the theory. Currently, the only spacecraft to have visited the outer icy giants is Voyager 2, but several other missions have been proposed to increase our understanding of these mysterious systems. Future missions aim to map more of the surfaces of these moons, identify more clues about how these ice giants are formed and how they differ from the closer gas giants, and as always, look for more clues about the formation of life and what other environments may be able to support it. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the rings and moons of Uranus and Neptune with us today, and all the information we've been able to gain from just a few decades of close observation. There's much more for us to discover, and next week we'll journey even farther out to Pluto and the other dwarf planets. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Settle the Stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform, and we're also mirroring our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. And be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworksentertainment, where you can get early episodes and tons of other great rewards. The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible, and I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. And be sure to leave a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Ratings are the single easiest way that you can help out podcasters like me. Thank you all for listening. And as always, happy terraforming. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula.